I am Marzuka Binte Avzal, a research intern at Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, and I welcome you all to today's uh, webinar uh, on understanding the threat of radicalization from a gender-based perspective uh, case of Bangladesh. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank our President Sir, uh, Major General Munuru Zaman, for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of our institute. I'd also like to thank uh, Celia Ma'am for uh, her uh, remarks uh, on today's concern. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I thank you all, uh, respected participants, uh, for being here today as I launch to the keynote presentation. If you could kindly wait, I'm going to share the screen. <clears throat> Welcome back everyone and I'm um, sorry for the delay. As I was saying, uh, I'm going to launch into the keynote presentation now. In today's presentation, I will be discussing the following concerns. Trends of female radicalization in Bangladesh, imminent threat of female radicalization in a post-pandemic Bangladesh, countering female radicalization through a gendered lens and more. <clears throat> so let's get into it. Any phenomena that impacts a society affects all gender in some ways, the same way, and in many differently. Uh, but only one gender is predominantly represented. And when it comes to political violence, structural violence, extremism, terrorism, and other uh, such impacts, gen uh, it affects all genders, uh, like any other aspect of human civilization and society would. Men and women both uh, get affected, whether in different trends and manners, uh, they get affected same, in the same way or differently. These, are, these situations happen for several reasons. Because while the overall output might be similar, the impact of it, the thought process of men and women, are in, uh, and their, their being involved, their abilities, their constraints and behavior are often different. Hence, their decision making is also different. We often hear violence has a gender and that it is men, but that is not in the entire picture. A gendered interpretation of violence recognizes that politics, religion, state, society, and culture project, uh, uh, project the different uh, power and ability, uh, a result of which is that men occupy the dominant social status and position in politics, state and society, while women are marginalized by men and are the subordinates. Men associated with masculinity are recognized as the perpetrators and active instigators of violent extremism with power, means and capacity, as well as agency. But women are associated with femininity and are recognized as the passive actors influenced and forced into compliance by their dominant male counterpart and more often than not recognized as the victims of violence in all shapes and forms. But women are, don't always get coerced into radicalization and extremism. The choice, despite having drivers behind them, are often consciously made as they are try to attain some kind of social belongingness and security, as well as try to find a sense of identity in a world that perhaps makes them question it. Both kinds can be seen in several cases of female radicalization and violent extremism in Bangladesh, as well as in Bangladesh diaspora. Targeted women are either victims of coercion or as we will now see, as we see more nowadays, uh, are looking to serve a higher purpose uh, in, for an afterlife, trying to find an identity, a purpose to live, and a feeling of belongingness. Women are no longer in, only victims, but propagators, plotters, and active extremists. If we have to discuss the evolution of female radicalization, we have to first talk about the evolution of Islamist terrorism in Bangladesh. And for that, we're going to move into our next concern, the waves of terrorism and female radicalization in Bangladesh. The wave theory is often used in discussing the different generations of terrorism in security studies. 
the religious extremism and terrorism hence can be divided into four basic waves. Their genesis, going back to the return of the veterans of the anti-Soviet struggle from the Afghan war in 1990s. The first wave started from the 1990s and continued till 2001. After the Afghan war, the veterans, now in connection with Al-Qaeda, felt the state was under the rule of Taguti forces. For those who do not know, Taguti forces, according to uh, one of the leaflets released earlier by JMB, meant non-Islamic. It basically means government forces who are aligned with the West. Then onwards began to brew the ideology of Al-Qaeda with the rise of AQ-inspired outlawed militant outfits such as Harkatul Jihad al-Islami Bangladesh, Hujibi, and later on um, Jamatul Mujahideen Bangladesh, JMB. Women in this wave were merely members of the families that the extremists belonged to. Moving on to the second wave, uh, it didn't last for very long. It was from 2001 till 2005. But during this time, JMB was in a lot, un, un, under a lot of power. Uh, they cast a wide net of terror and particularly the, the pressure was felt in 2005 when simultaneously in over 300 locations all over the country, 500 bomb blasts took place. JMB thrived and became stronger and falling under this pressure, the law enforcement began to catch the leaders of JMB, like Bangla Bhai, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Siddiqur Rahman, Sani, and others. And these, there are about seven leaders got hanged in 2007. Women still in their sedentary roles maintained households uh, and they got married to the members of the militants, um, uh, of the militant cells and reared future militants uh, in, in uh, following under the same ideology. Moving on, uh, the third wave started uh, from then onwards and con continued till 2016. This tenure saw the growth of several terrorist group, groups like Hujibi and particularly the rise of Ansarullah Bangla team. From here, till, from 2013 to 2015, ABT came under a lot of attention uh, from the statesmen and from media, etc. Particularly because of the multiple attacks on atheist bloggers, uh, journalists, scholars, and professors uh, that began to plague the country during that time. And then the fateful day of 1st June, July came. The attack in Holy Artisan Bakery took place. Here, however, we noticed a, a huge shift in the women's role in terrorism. Uh, particularly uh, when we observed that the involvement of women increased. Women were no longer limited in their home, homes anymore, in, the, in their sedentary roles. They were brought out to work as recruiters of uh, radicalizing more women and youth, receiving and carrying important confidential messages to and from cells, carrying concealed weapons, and propagating narratives of these outfits. Salafi jihadists, ideology began to accept women's participation in their so-called jihad. So because of that, the ICE-inspired terror outfits began to adapt it as well. And then from uh, uh, past the Holy Artisan attack in 2016, we get to the present time where the fourth wave continued. During this time, uh, we have seen that women, are, the targeted women are turning out to be more well-educated and well-trained in information technology. Uh, during this time, uh, they began to take on more active roles in terror cells, uh, working as not only recruiters, but also recruiting people online through multiple identities in websites created uh, by the cells, creating online narratives based on terror ideologies, etc. They also acted as foot soldiers and suicide bombers. Here's a brief timeline that carries the major attacks throughout the all four waves that I've already discussed. As you can see, the yellow marked uh, ones are from the first wave, uh, the, which started basically from the Udichi uh, festival uh, uh, attack that took, took place in Kulna, as well as the attack at uh, Ahmadiyya Mosque. And carry, the Muramna Botomul bombing by Hujibi also took place during that uh, wave. Then we have several bombings, such as in the shrine in Tangail and a, bomb, a bombing in Shah Jalal Shrine as well. And the simultaneous bombing that I spoke about earlier, the uh, simultaneous 500 bombings in 300 locations of the country took place in the second wave. 
The third wave, of course, marks the rise of AB, uh, ABT and the attacks on uh, on people like Muhyuddin Ahmed, Rajib Haider, and uh, Sun, uh, Sanyur Rahman, and the attack on Holly Artisan Bakery. And finally, we see an example here, the suicide bombing in Rap Camp in Dhaka, and the suicide bombing in uh, Hazrat Shah Jalal Airport, International Airport by ISIL and, uh, and Neo JMB as well. This timeline shows a major uh, representation of female terrorists. As you can see from the timeline here, uh, you will notice that most of these women are all caught during the time of fourth generation, which means that most of these women were either recruited in, in the third wave and must have carried on uh, developing their skills uh, in, uh, during this time and uh, uh, hands got caught in the fourth generation. As you can see, first we can see uh, Aklima Rahman. She's an, hard, she's an example of a hardened extremist who later on influenced two other uh, radica radicalists into becoming extremists like um, Meghna and Mo, as you can see here, who got caught by uh, the uh, agencies twice. We see Abitatul Fatima here as well. She's one of those examples of women who are well educated and well settled and financially independent as well, but still got coerced due to social stigma and because of the fear of be being abandoned by their husband into extremism. We see example of a lone wolf, uh, Momena Shoma as well. And examples like Asmani Khatun and Shirina Khatun are the new examples of female leadership being developed in uh, Terror, uh, mil uh, outlawed mil uh, militant outfits such as new JMB. Moving on, let's talk about what drives women into female radicalization. While most of the drivers of radicalization work the same way for both men and women for social constructs and different constraints, th which are gendered, the drivers impact women differently than they do uh, men. We're going to discuss four basic uh, drivers of female radicalization. They're social drivers, religious, psychological, and economic drivers. So let's get started. Social drivers are predominantly uh, uh, a fear of uh, women, and they particularly uh, affect women because of the social constructs and constraints that are gendered in society, which makes women quite dependent on men, on their male counterpart for security, agency, and uh, their, uh, their identity, as well as their uh, self-respect. In a lot of cases, they are dependent economically as well, because of which fear of being abandoned by husbands, social stigma, neglect, vulnerability, etc., become weapons or, of radicalization. Then again, history of domestic violence and rape, violence or revenge of a fallen brethren and, or husband and feeling of be belonging in a sisterhood also influences them in these regards. Religious strivers mostly take effect due to the lack of religious knowledge and lack of religious identity as well as a deepened sense of religious sentiment. In these regards, uh, religious strivers can impact them to think about martyrdom or uh, getting reward in Jannat or having a religious identity. Psychological drivers are perhaps the most important uh, drivers that we'll be discussing in this uh, presentation, which basically is the underlying driver of almost all the other um, uh, drivers of rad radicalization. We can see that a lot of these uh, uh, issues such as identity crisis, whether religious or social identity, existential, existential crisis, feeling of belongingness to a certain group such as a sisterhood or being accepted in a social circle or having fellow feelings towards the cell, these kind of feelings as well as uh, feelings of uh, going for an adventure or romanticism and suffering from frustration can trigger people, in, uh, women into getting into a, a radicalized group. And finally, economic drivers are basically the same, uh, financially dependent, dependent on a husband or a male counterpart, such as a father or a brother, and not feeling empowered can impact women into becoming radicalized. Now that we know what the uh, drivers are, we've briefly discussed it, let's move on to the new trends. 
we can see an increase in female radicalization uh, and female led terror units nowadays previously only taken into play roles of wives and sisters and taken to accompany in hijrat women are now becoming active role players even foot soldiers on the terror causes as we've discussed before uh, women are now participating more actively which leads to extremist groups relying more on women to gain strategic advantage recru recruiting them as a facilitator and martyrs while also benefiting from their subjugation and sophisticated outreach due to the technology gender specific interpretation of female suicide bombers in al qaeda as we've already seen uh, that is seen in media etc as we've also discussed uh, and we will further discuss it as well women in terrorism gain more media attention and become sensational news ensuring widespread of terror terrorist narrative and ideology family is a terror unit is a major concern particularly in bangladesh women easily are capable of recruiting men and women much better than their male counters uh, uh, male recruiters a radicalized woman in a family can thereby radicalize her husband and sons as as well and soon radicalize another woman in another family or in another society who can uh, in that result uh, uh, radicalize her uh, husband and sons spreading terrorism terrorist ideology and narrative like a contagion and finally jihadi feminism it's not a major concern right now for us but it should be uh, something to consider because it could be an imminent threat soon women looking for understanding environment of sisterhood finding an uh, empowerment in violence that is justified by false and misinterpreted religious notions make them feel like they are doing something concrete to contribute to a society humanity and religion so why are women targeted why are women such desirable candidates for extremism women are suspected less women are still largely believed to be victims meek and too subordinate to actually be active participants in terrorism let alone be propagandists influencers and leaders they are checked less for concealed weapons and looked into less due to there not being enough female officers in security forces and law in, uh, enforcement agencies who can intervene them and check them for any hidden weapons or uh, suspect suspecting objects women are better recruiters who do not only recruit other potential female radicals but also recruit men better than male recruiters their presence online is better reading the targets mindset and enticing them inspiring and manipulating them more than their male counterpart and this is one of the things that women are better at female extremists and suicide bombers create more sensational news as i've already said they make better headlines than male extremists do making them perfect candidates to spread the message and ideologies of militant outfits more eyes means more views means the faster the message and ideology of the uh, terrorist organizations spread women want to get empowered and become active participants to create a better society based on religion and equality makes them susceptible to radicalization by terror outfits like ansar al islam uh, ai or neo jmb which again it falls into the uh, line of jihad feminism as i've discussed earlier moving on to talk about something that we are all worried about right now the imminent threat of female radicalization in a post covid bangladesh while the world's attention befittingly con concentrates on the health and economic impacts of covid-19 the threat of radicalization leading to a violent extremism persists still while everybody is sitting at home and keeping safe terrorism is still propagating in some circumstances it it, it has aggravated during this crisis the lockdowns quarantines and inactive time during the closure facilitate a few situations that create multiple grounds for the process of radi spreading radicalization young women and men are confined at home and surfing the internet unsupervised while they come across radicalizing narratives from websites and social media which is basically cyber radicalization women who are out of work are suffering from frustration and depression sparking the need to divert their minds in causes that keep them active and can provide them with an alternative financial support or source the rise of domestic and sexual violence on the other hand over the last few months since the pandemic started makes women further vulnerable to radicalization because they feel vulnerable and that they have nowhere else to go and they have no other choice and when 
terrorist organizations offer them that kind of support and release from their uh, 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 violences, they accept it. Now to talk about a way forward, countering violent extremism and radicalization through a gendered lens. Women's participation in countering terrorism is more, uh, puts a more impactful uh, effect than they contribute when radicalized. Law enforcement agencies and security forces need to be more gender inclusive, hiring women to fill a certain quota till gender parity is ensured. Counter narrative messages should be targeted towards women as they are the singular impactful individual in a family, as we observed in the discussion of family as a terror unit. More emphasis need to be given to the psychological drivers of radicalization of both women and youth to properly understand how the social and economic roles come into play. There needs to be space on research on female radicalization and collaboration and transparency between security and terrorism researchers and law enforcement and counter terrorism units. Countering violent extremism, CVE, needs to be more a, of a wider dis, uh, study of discipline and uh, security studies and research needs to become more gender inclusive, encouraging women to participate and promote research. BEEPS has been involved in researching female radicalization and preventing violent extremism, as we know PVE, for a long time. Over their last, uh, one of their last successful uh, uh, such initiatives was the National Conference on Prevention of Violent Extremism from a Gendered Perspective. A conference report that you can find uh, was published following it. Emphasis should be given on strengthening social resilience to ensure safety and security for women against domestic violence, sexual violence, and discrimination. Empowering women of all spheres and economic background, providing better education, training, and religious teachings to enlighten and strengthen them can also be another solution. Religious institutes in this case can come very useful where they should have better approach at conveying correct religious teachings and proper interpretations of narrating, uh, which narrate uh, passages against terrorism. They should ensure people dignify women from a religious standpoint, promoting women's safety and empowerment and promoting uh, communal fellow feelings, etc. We've come to the end of the presentation. I thank you all for being so patient and kind with me and hearing me out. I give the floor back to uh, Shafkat Munir sir, uh, and I, hear my, I end my uh, presentation here. Thank you all.